So many of us have had the experience of being in love, and it's a very important and very, very, very powerful uh, experience, as in it's a very powerful series of emotions, everything from uh, maybe initial attraction and then kind of fascination, hopefully bordering not on obsession. And then there's uh, the initial kind of conversation and, and uh, uh, exchange of numbers and all of this kind of thing. And then there's initial contact and dates and the, the, that, that kind of excitement and joy and looking forward to seeing the person the next time. And then you meet again, then you meet again and all this kind of joy and, and uh, it's great, a great feeling of expectation and fulfillment. And then there are gifts and there's flowers and there's anniversaries and there's chocolates and there's dates and all sorts of wonderful stuff. That's the way it is then forever and ever and ever while you're married. It's just fantastic. <laughs> Um, it's just great. So, um, the Lord uses this experience and this reality uh, to explain something else. So, the, the, the experience of, of being in love and the experience of being married. The Lord, in, in our first reading today, this is the kind of relationship he wishes to have with his people, with his church. So, in the prophet Hosea, the Lord speaks of his people as his bride. So the people of Israel, the chosen people, and of course, fast forwarding to our day, the church. The Lord wants to have a relationship with the church, not as um, a boss to his employees, or a king to his subjects, or a dictator to all of the subordinates, uh, but he wants to have a relationship with his church as a husband does to his wife. So it's, a, it, it, it's, it's an image that we can all understand because we've all seen it or, we've all ex or you've all experienced it, those who are married, me not, obviously. Uh, but those who have experienced it have seen this reality. All of us have obviously seen our parents um, or at least we know people who are married and we've seen this relationship. So it's a very uh, tangible comparison or metaphor uh, analogy that the Lord is using here. And so... If we, his people, or if his chosen people, those who he loves, those who he has sacrificed himself for, if we don't choose him, so if we don't put God in the first place, if we put other things in the first place, career, money, success, power, influence, all these other things, good looks, likes on Facebook, whatever it may be, HD brows, uh, whatever it may be, anything else that we might put in the first place, the Lord then considers that adultery. It's very interesting. It's a very, very interesting idea that when uh, he, his chosen people, his beloved, his bride, when they don't consider him good enough and, and choose something else, he considers that adultery. And again, it's something very easy for us to understand. We can under, understand the, the, the joy, the elation, the excitement of being with someone and, and then maybe getting married and um, the companionship and friendship that should be growing constantly and changing somewhat as the relationship continues. And then, boom, the bomb is dropped and you discover that your partner, your husband or your wife has been unfaithful, maybe for years. You know, like you can just imagine how that would cut to the core. Just like, how, how long? How didn't I know? How didn't I see this? Why? What's wrong with me? Why? Why, was some, why did I not love you enough? Did I, am I not good enough for you? Is it, I'm, I'm not pretty enough for you? I'm not handsome enough? Am I, am I not, what, what did I do? What could I have done? Or how dare you? <laughs> All the possible reactions that one could have. Uh, but this is how, how God sees it when we, his people, don't consider him enough. That, considers it like, like a betrayal, like, like adultery. You know, it's something, it's, something so, it's something so brutal when it happens uh, in a relationship or in a marriage because it, it, it's done. It's, it's kind of stuck. There's, kind of, there's no way. You, you, yes, of course, you can ask for forgiveness and the person can forgive, but, but once, once it happens, it, it, it's done. Uh, once the adultery has happened, uh, the act of, of infidelity now has to be, you know, r repaired or, or, but it's, 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 in history, it's stuck, you know? And that memory, that, 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 that hurt, 
that maybe fear, that insecurity, uh, and so much needs to be done to, to repair all of that. So again, it's something we can very easily understand, but we kind of forget how much the Lord longs for us. Just, I guess, the way, I mean, maybe I'm speaking for myself, but when I was growing up, you, we kind of get the impression, see, God's all-knowing, all-powerful, so he's grand. He actually, he's fine. And if I'm here or not here, if I pray, don't pray, if I'm good, bad, or indifferent, it actually makes no difference to him. Because he's grand, sure. I mean, he's fine. He's in heaven already. So he lacks nothing. So what does it actually matter? What does it matter if I pray? If I go to Mass or don't go to Mass, what, what does it, who, who cares, really? Because I don't think he notices. There's millions or billions of people going to Mass. They're fine. One more, one less. You know, maybe this is maybe this is me. Maybe I, it was, it was just me. But, but that's really not the case. Because the Lord sees and knows and actually desires every single one of us. And there is nobody, nobody, who can love God like you. And anybody, any parent of any more than one child, two children, three children, four, ten, each one of your children is completely different, even though they grew up under the same economic circumstances and you, you tried to give them the same amount of love, but they will all turn out differently. They're all different. They're all different. And if a parent is loved by three of four children, they won't say, well, three out of four, it's a majority, 75%, good to go. It's a pass. No parent will say that. They'll say, well, why, why isn't John keeping in contact? Is, is, is everything okay? I mean, where is he? You know, and if you have 10 children, and nine of them are great to keep, and they're living all the lo in the locality, you know, and they're all close by, they pop in, but there's one who's gone off to Australia and never keeps in the choir. Good old Mary Jane here. What's happened to her at all? Where is she? You'd never say 90% were, were, were fairly good. That's just, just, uh, good parents would never think that. So God then, he doesn't look and say, well, there are, there are lots of people who pray, so that's, that, that's good enough. No one, nobody can love God like you. Your love is unique because you're unique. And so the Lord wishes to have a, 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 a profoundly close relationship to each one of us. Not a generic kind of a, you know, let's all kind of pretend we're happy families and I'll be the king and you can run around and farm or be soldiers. Or, he wants us to actually be like in a family, in a relationship, to actually have a spousal relationship with him. Incredible. That's how close he wants to be to us. And that's up to us to answer. He's, he has done his part. He has expressed his love for us. He has given himself out of love for us. So he has, he has done everything that he can do, even become one like us. So we don't just have to love a kind of a, a powerful God who don't, doesn't actually have a human body and doesn't actually have a human face because he doesn't have a human nature. But now we can. Now we can love a God who at the same time is God and actually has a human body and a human face and a human nature. Like he's done everything possible to make this communion with him possible. And now the answer is up to us. And so I think he asks us that question, am, am I enough? Am I enough for you? I want to be your God. Will you be my people? Two ways I set before you, man. Life and death. Blessing and curse. Choose life. Choose me. That you and your descendants may live. That's what he tells us in Deuteronomy. And so we ask the good Lord to open our eyes to see him as he truly is. Open our hearts to recognize the love that he lavishes upon us and strengthen our intellect and our will that we may know what his call holds for us and then with our will choose to respond to his love with ours. Amen.